Well, to God be the glory for the great things our God has done. Our God is great and greatly to be praised. And on this Wednesday night at the Tri-Cities Revival, we may as well give God the glory that is due unto his name. Help me celebrate a great God who deserves great praise. Amen. What a mighty God we serve. How we honor the Lord tonight for this wonderful privilege to be together as the people of God in the house of God known as Metropolitan. To give thanks to God for his goodness and his grace, for his grandeur and his glory. To our coordinator tonight, how we thank God for Pastor Taylor and for his leadership in this experience of revival. Thank you so much, sir, for your generous invitation to allow me to come and share. Thank you for your hospitality, for your indulgence, for all that you have shared with me as we prepared for this experience of revival. I praise God for you. To our host pastor and the co-coordinator for this time, my beloved brother of more than 30 years, how I thank God for my friend, Dr. Damone P. Johnson. Will you help me celebrate him tonight? How we thank God for our moderator tonight. Moderator night, we celebrate you, ma'am, and we praise God for your leadership. And to the senior pastor among us, Pastor Dixon, God bless you, sir. We honor you tonight for who you are. Thank you for your presence tonight. We're blessed by your presence. We thank God for you. To all of the reverend clergy who occupy space in this place and to all those who walk by faith and not by sight, it's good for us to be here. Old Saint said, I'm glad to be in the service one more time. He didn't have to let me live. He didn't have to let me live. But I'm glad to be in the service one more time. I think there's somebody on your road that's glad to be in the service one more time. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, choir, for your masterful musicianship tonight. Thank you, musicians, for ushering us into the presence of God on the wings of song. You have blessed us tonight, and we thank God for you. To their honor, these wonderful judges who sit on the state Supreme Court, we praise God for you and are praying for you uh, that you will be returned to the bench and you will be able to govern and rule and, and, and judge in a way that brings glory to God. God bless you, lady and gentleman. God bless you. To the clergy, spouses, and to all those who give leadership to this wonderful Tri-Cities experience. I thank God for the privilege to be back again this year. I'm honored to uh, be, have been invited to come and share, I think. I heard what my friend did in this place for the last two nights. And um, I'm about sick of John Robert Adolph already. I'm just about sick of him. He is my brother beloved, he's my Texas brother. He and I went to seminary together and I knew when I, when I heard he was preaching, I knew that it was gonna be some terror in this place. But aren't you glad you were able to be blessed by the ministry of Dr. John Robert Adolph, amen. What a preacher he is and how we thank God for the wonderful way that God uses him every time he stands to preach the word of God to us. Well, there's a word from the Lord tonight, and if you have your Bibles, I invite your attention to the New Testament gospel as recorded by the writer Luke. The New Testament gospel as recorded by the writer Luke. I thank God for the wheel of wherever saints who are in the place today. I see you. Thank God for representing tonight. Luke chapter 5. The New Testament gospel as recorded by the writer Luke at chapter 5. We'll begin our reading at verse 11. The New Testament gospel as recorded by the writer Luke at chapter 5, and we'll begin our reading tonight. At verse 11. If you have that passage of scripture, say amen. amen. If you don't say, wait for me. I'm waiting. I heard you. The New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, the third of the New Testament gospels. Luke chapter 5. And we'll begin our reading at verse 11. I'm reading tonight from the New International Version of the Holy Word of God. It may read a bit differently from the translation that you hold. But it is the Word of God. And this is what it says. So they pulled their boats up on the shore, 
left everything and followed him. That's enough. Amen. Praise God for his holy word. Amen. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. For the time that is out to share together tonight, I want to talk from the subject, I have decided to follow Jesus. There's some in the church house who are very familiar with the words of that sermon subject tonight. I suspect if you've been around the church for a little while, you've sung that song with that, that title. I suspect if you've been in the Baptist church for about a day and a half, you've heard that song <laughs> sung in the church. It is a song of intentionality. It is a song of determination. It is a song that speaks to the reality that we found something in that man named Jesus that is worthy of emulation and celebration. That song, with its repetition, gives to us this significant intentionality of the singer and literally suggests that no matter what goes down, I've made up in my mind that Jesus Christ is worthy of my following. If you've never heard it, you can learn it while I'm standing here talking to you. Well, the words are repeated over and over again in each stanza. It goes a little something like this. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The second stanza says, though no one joined me, still I will follow. Though no one joined me, still I will follow. Though no one joined me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. The third stanza goes like this. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. Do you hear the intentionality that no matter what comes or goes, no matter who stays or leaves, I've found something in that man named Jesus that makes him worthy of me following all the days of my life. There's an intentionality, I tell you. There's a determination to making sure that all the days of my life, I'm going to be committed to the one who's committed to me. It's, it's reminiscent of the words of Jesus himself when he says that no one who puts their hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. That when you hook up with the Holy One, it is not just a rendezvous for a season. It's supposed to be a commitment for a lifetime. And I got a funny feeling and a sneaking suspicion that there's somebody in Metropolitan tonight who's made up in your mind that for the rest of your days you have decided to follow that man named Jesus. And you love him so much now that there's no turning back. No turning back. Some saints have said by in, in times gone by that if the devil sh if wanted to get me, he should have gotten me a long time ago. But I've spent too much time with Jesus now. I've gone too far with him now. I know too much about him now. Hear, hear the words of our elders. You can't make me doubt it. Because I know too much about him. I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. That's the sentiment of Luke chapter 5, my brothers and sisters. In these first 11 verses of this fifth chapter of the third gospel of the New Testament, the writer Luke is helping us to understand that the Lord Jesus, upon choosing these first disciples, calls them to a life that is worthy of their following him. They, he calls them to a life that commits them to a, a, a wonderful experience of both seeing what he is able to do and then moving 
moving to the place where they are able to do what he what he said they would be able to do this blesses me church that when you hook up with Jesus you get to see stuff that other folk may not get to see and experience stuff that others may not get to experience when you hook up with Jesus my folks said every day when Jesus gets sweeter than the day before he shows you another glimpse of his glory he proves to you that there is nothing impossible with him he shows to you that when you hook up with him he will take you to levels you never thought possible somebody tonight can testify you're so glad that somewhere along your life's journey you decided to follow Jesus and there's no turning back hear me church family when you look at Luke chapter 5 you'll find out that the Lord Jesus takes these ordinary fishermen they are ordinary fishermen who have been educated in fishing they are experienced in fishing they are not novice to the task they know what they are doing they have done it for an extended period of time but by the time we catch up with them in in Luke chapter 5 that which they are experienced in doing that which they are educated in doing that which they know how to do has yielded them no profitable results when you read Luke chapter 5 you'll find out that these brothers have been on the water the Sea of Galilee likewise known as the Lake of Gennesaret and they have been out there toiling working hard all night long and your Bible says says that although they worked hard all night long, they caught absolutely nothing. Hold up, wait a minute, flag on the play. Something's not right. I think I just told you these are expert fishermen. These are educated fishermen. These are experienced fishermen. But when we catch up with them on the seashore of the Lake of Gennesaret, your Bible says they are washing their nets, washing their nest that my friend is a sign of finality I'm done things did not work the way I had planned them stuff did not go down the way I intended it to go down I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired where's Fannie Lou Hamer when you need her and there they are on the Sea of Galilee frustrated agitated because things didn't work the way they had planned I don't know if you heard but these are expert fishermen they are experienced fishermen they are educated fishermen but that which they had been trained to do yielded them no profitable results. Have you ever been there? <laughs> when that which you knew how to do did not work for you the way you had planned for it to work for you. Have you ever been there where things didn't go according to your plan and you're so frustrated at the end of the journey you don't want nobody talking to you you don't want anybody looking at you You, if they say the wrong thing you're going to say something to them that ain't in the 23rd Psalm or the Lord's Prayer. you like leave me alone now don't push me because I'm close to the edge I'm trying not to lose my it's like a jungle sometimes it makes me wonder how I keep from going under <laughs> Here they are, <laughs> here they are, here they are standing on the seashore of the Lake of Gennesaret, the Sea of Galilee, and they are frustrated, agitated because things didn't work according to their plans. And here is Jesus, watch it church, here is Jesus on the seashore having worship by the water. Jesus is having worship early in the morning and into that morning worship experience comes a crowd of brothers and sisters who want to hear the word of God. Jesus is preaching the word of God and while he's preaching, crowds have gathered so significantly that Jesus asks Peter, one of these fishermen, see if he can borrow his boat. He says, let me use your boat because I need to get out a little farther from the 
seashore so the people can see and hear me. He gets into the boat. He pushes out a little farther from the seashore and he keeps on preaching and teaching the word. Once the benediction has been pronounced, then Jesus looks at Simon Peter and says, hey, hey man, launch out into the deep and let your net down for a big catch. Church folk don't know where to shout. That was a good spot to at least nod and amen. That was a good spot. He says, listen here, now that I'm done with the church service, I want you to walk, walk, get back into your boat and launch out into the deep and let your net down for a big catch. Now, I don't know if you heard the preacher, but they had been out there all night long and your Bible says they had caught absolutely nothing. They're standing on the seashore washing their nets. It's a sign of finality. I'm done. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I ain't going out there no more. Stuff should have worked differently for me. Things should have gone better for me. I don't feel like it. I ain't trying to be bothered right now. Who are you, Mr. Jesus, to tell me to go out there when you know good and well your daddy was a carpenter? I've been fishing for a long time. I'm expert, experienced, educated in fishing. Leave me alone now. I'm tired of this. And there will be some times, church family, when you and I will get tired of this. <laughs> Whatever your this is with your saved self, you'll get tired of this. Whatever your this is with your sanctified self, you'll get tired of this. I know you got a Bible in your lap right now, but if you let the wrong thing get a hold of you, you'll get tired of this. I know you got an app on your phone, but can I find six honest Christians in every section who will testify that sometimes life will knock the life out of you. And it will make you tired of everything going on. Jesus says, launch out into the deep. Let your net down for a big catch. He says, Master, we toyed all night long, caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I'll let down the net. Now, I like this church family. He is trusting the word of the Lord Jesus Christ, which makes us have to understand the context out of which this text comes. If you back up to chapter 4, you'll find out that the Lord Jesus has just been baptized by John in the River Jordan. And after he has been baptized, he is led by the spirit into the wilderness it is there that he fasts for 40 days he's praying to God and while he's there the enemy comes to tempt him have you heard about it as a matter of fact he tempts him three times the first time after knowing how hungry he is he says listen if you're the son of God command these stones to be made bread to which Jesus says it is written man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out the mouth of God he takes him high to the pinnacle of the temple he gives him a bird's eye view of everything that is there he says listen I will give you all of these things of the world if you will just fall down and worship me to which Jesus replies it is written worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve well he gives him a third temptation he says listen Listen here, I just need you to understand that, uh, that if you go up there to the pinnacle of the temple and jump down, you know that the Bible says that God will give his angels charge over you to keep you lest you dash your foot against the stone. He said, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. <laughs> Every time the enemy came against him, Jesus whipped him with the word. Woo! Don't you miss this child of God. Every time he came against him, he whipped him with the word so much so after that third temptation your Bible says that the devil left him for a season <laughs> don't you fool yourself I don't care how spiritual you think you are just cause you whooped the devil last week don't mean he ain't coming back just cause you whooped the devil last month don't mean he's not gonna show up again is there anybody in here who can testify he'll retreat to regroup to reattack is there anybody who can testify he doesn't leave you for long he'll show back up with your spiritual self 
leaves him for a season. When he leaves him for a season, your Bible says that Jesus now goes into the synagogue on the Sabbath day as was his custom. It's Luke chapter 4. He goes into the synagogue on the Sabbath day as was his custom. Dr. Johnson, I love that phrase, as was his custom. Literally suggesting that Jesus went to church early. We And if Jesus went to church every week with his sinless self, you know good and well you and I need to go to church as often as we possibly can with some of the stuff that goes through our minds on a daily basis. Can I get three honest people in here who can testify? I love the Lord, but some stuff be in my head sometimes. I need to get to church. goes to church when he gets to the synagogue he takes the scroll from the minister he opens it to Isaiah chapter 61 and he begins to read the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor recovery of sight to the blind deliverance to the captive to set at liberty those who are bruised to preach the acceptable year of the Lord your Bible says when he did that he rolled up the scroll gave it back to the minister looked at everybody and said today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing he literally says the one you've been looking for is the one you looking at <laughs> you don't have to wait any longer the Messiah has come and I've come to show you what thus saith the Lord and your Bible says that for the next several verses he is preaching and teaching and healing and the more he preaches and teaches and healing he is amazing everybody who is in the synagogue and the surrounding area so much so that when he preached and taught your Bible says in verses 32 and 36 of chapter 4 that his word had power and authority don't miss it don't miss it that every time he opened his mouth his words had power and authority Oh, preachers, would to God that every time we stand up, we stand up with power and authority. I don't care how you preach. I don't care if you're a three-point preacher. I don't care if you're a thematic preacher. I don't care if you're exegetical. I don't care if you if you're just expository. I just want to know if you can open your mouth with some power. I want to know if somebody can feel the conviction of the Holy Ghost every time. I don't care if you who. I don't care if you never raise your voice. I need some power uh, and authority Jesus spoke with power and authority so much so that by the time you get to the end of chapter 4 they are begging Jesus don't leave us Jesus said I got to go elsewhere because I need to take this gospel as far as I can take it they say please don't leave us he said I got to go I cannot be a parochialized preacher I'm not a localized preacher I got to go everywhere my father sends me and then he takes his leave he departs from them he crosses the water and that's when we get to chapter 5, and when we get to chapter 5, Jesus is having worship on the water. Oh, I don't know about you, church, but that's the kind of church I want to go to. I love these four consecrated walls, but I sure don't mind having a little worship on the water. I don't know. I don't know if you have the same kind of inclinations that I do, but it's just something about that blue azure water. When we have our opportunity to just spend some time out there, I'm telling you now, my retirement plan is not to be in the sanctuary every week. I'm going to have worship on the water. I'm going to wake up some and the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth forth his handiwork. But that's just me. And so the Bible says, the Bible says that he is having worship on the water. Verse 1 says he's preaching the word of God to them. He's letting them know the unsearchable riches of the grace, grandeur, and glory of God. And while he's preaching, throngs of people have surrounded him. People have come from everywhere to hear this fresh-faced gentleman who's been preaching the word of God. And everybody's been impressed with him, been amazed by him, astonished that he can speak with such profundity and power. And when he preaches, the bened when he preaches his sermon and pronounces the benediction, the Bible says he tells Peter to launch out into the deep and let your net down for a big catch. 
Yeah, yeah. Somebody caught it over there. I'm not sure. Everybody else caught it. Your King James Version says a drought. D-R-A-U-G-H-T. Ain't nobody in this sanctuary said that word all year long. The word is defined. A big catch. He literally wants to set them up for a hookup they never could have anticipated or expected were it not for him being in the equation of their lives. Is there anybody in this church tonight who can testify that the Lord Jesus is so amazing that when you insert him into the equation of your life, he will do that which blows your mind, goes beyond your wildest expectation. Is there anybody who still believes God for a big check? Yes, Lord. Now, this is intriguing to me. This is intriguing to me because if we decide to follow Jesus, I submit tonight, uh, Brother Taylor, Pastor Taylor, that if we're going to follow Jesus, decide to follow Jesus, that sometimes we have to do so despite worrisome situations. That, that, that's the first of my two points. I only got two points tonight. I got two points. And that first one is that sometimes when we decide to follow Jesus, we have to do so despite worrisome situations. What are you talking about, preacher? I've tried to tell you already that this is not the most opportune time for these brothers to do what Jesus says do. These brothers have been toiling all night long. Did I mention that to you? They've been out on the water working hard all night long. And now Jesus has the nerve to tell them to go back out there and try it again. Launch out into the deep and let your net down for a catch. I'm watching my net. I'm done. It's a sign of finality. I'm tired. And that's the first challenge. That's the first of the worrisome situations. They are dealing with the reality that Jesus has the nerve to tell them to do something at a most inopportune time. They are tired. I don't know if the Lord has ever compelled you to do something when you were tired. Sometimes you want to say, hey, Mr. Jesus, I've been serving you now. And I don't feel like this right now. I'm tired. I'm worn out. Children on my nerves. Spouse on my nerves. Uh, boss on my nerves. I'm getting on my own nerves sometimes. I don't, I don't even want to listen to myself talk some. If you'll be honest tonight, You've been tired a time or two or three or twelve. You knew the Lord was compelling you, calling you to do something. And, and the weight of the, of the assignment was so stressful, so burdensome. And the tiredness, the weariness you were already feeling was like, hold up, Mr. Jesus. Stop this ride. I want to get off. This, my friend, is a worrisome Situation. I'm talking tonight to one of us in the Tri-Cities Revival. Uh, because in a meeting like this, these are professional church people. You come to this meeting, you used to church. You know church. You know when to say amen. You know when to close your eyes. You know when to wave your hand. You know when to do everything. You are professional. Ain't no novices in here tonight. If there are, it's about four of them in every section. Everybody else been coming to Tri-Cities Revival for at least four years, at least three years, two years. And you are not new to this. But there's some times when even with your Christian experience, you want to say, not now, Jesus. I've been doing this a long time. I'm tired. Master! We worked hard all night long. King James Version says toiled. I like that word, toiled all night long. We weren't playing. It wasn't guys' night out. We weren't just having a good time. We worked hard all night long, and now Jesus is calling you to do something, and this is worrisome. This is frustrating. This is, I, I get it, I get it. Maybe, maybe you haven't gotten with me now because you, you, don't, you don't know that word worrisome. Maybe you like my people down in Coldwater, Mississippi. 
They don't say worrisome situations. They say worsome situations. See, I added a syllable and that messed you all up. Let, 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 is there anybody in here who knows something about worsome situations? Anybody know something about worsome chilling? Anybody know something about worsome church folk? Don't look, don't look, don't look. Anybody know something about some worsome situations? First of all, they're tired. Somebody shout tired. And if tired wasn't bad enough, brothers and sisters, this is the wrong time for Jesus to be calling them to do something. It's the wrong time. I told you it's early in the morning. They've been on the water now all night long, and now they're washing their nets on the seashore early in the morning. And uh, this is not the right time for fishing. See, I, I don't know if you heard, but these are expert fishermen. These are experienced fishermen. These are educated fishermen. They know how to fish, and they understand that you don't drag your nets in the early morning hours because the water is too choppy. The water is not placid like it is at nighttime, and so you don't drag your net. And if that wasn't bad enough, the fish go deep into the water in the daytime. They're not fly, so they're not they're not fishing. They're swimming on the tops of the water at this time of the day, and so they understand this is the wrong time. I told you Jesus was a carpenter. He don't know nothing about fishing. He's calling us to do something at the wrong time. H have, you ever, have you ever had Jesus call you to do something it didn't seem like the right time? H have you ever had Jesus to pull you out of your comfort zone at what seemed to be the wrong time? Have you ever heard Jesus give you an assignment? You knew it was Jesus. You were trying to ignore it because it was the wrong time. And you're trying now to cajole Jesus. Come on, Jesus, just give me a little more time. Let me get these children out the house. Let me get through school. Let me finish this degree. Let me retire. Let me do this. Let me do that. And then I'll be sold out to you. And Jesus said, I'm not asking you about your time schedule because the Bible says that our times are in his hand. And is there anybody in here who can testify? If you'll trust him with your right now, he will blow your mind, but you're not yet. You didn't hear what I just said. I said, if you trust him with your right now, he will blow your mind with your not yet. It's the wrong time, Jesus. We're tired, Jesus. These are some worrisome situations. And if you'll be honest tonight, church, you'll have to testify we're living in some worrisome situations. If you just turn the TV on, read the newspaper, check, check, check your phone, you'll find out we're living through some worrisome situations. Racism is still rampant in our time. Sexism and classism and ageism are still rampant in our time. We're still dealing with the rough reality that 45 is trying to come back. This makes no sense. Oh, but somebody say four indictments, four indictments. And here he is. Here it is now. We're dealing with worsome situations. And worsome situations will cause you to do things you never anticipated. Don't you fool yourself. When worsome situations get on you, it'll make you find a folding chair somewhere. It, it'll make... It, when you get sick and tired, when you get fed up for real, you're going to get a folding chair and anybody in your way is in jeopardy, I'm telling you. When you sure enough get tired of your brothers and sisters getting messed over, you'll jump in the water and swim to their rescue. All your clothes on, shoes on, everything. You'll swim over there as fast as you can. You might not get there in a hurry, but just keep swimming. Keep swimming. Keep swimming. You might not be on the Olympic team, but keep swimming. Get over there and take your boots off and help your brothers and sisters. We're living. We're living through some worsome situations. And there's some people who are tired. <laughs> there's some people who can testify. It's the wrong time to be bothering me right now. But if that wasn't bad enough, 
There's these fish have been messing with these brothers' treasure. What are you talking about, Cosby? I don't know if you heard me, but these are professional fishermen. They're expert fishermen. They're experienced and educated fishermen. They fish for a living. And if the fish aren't jumping, they're not getting paid. Can we be practical for a minute? If the fish aren't getting in the net, they can't go to the marketplace and they can no longer satisfy the responsibilities of their lives. If they're not getting paid, if their money is off, if their economy is bad, they cannot handle their life's responsibilities. And I appreciate your spirituality. Everybody in here is acting as if that would never bother you. You're looking at me as if to say, oh, that would never trouble me. All right, let your check be short this Friday and we'll see how spiritual you are. <laughs> Come on, let's be honest with one another. If your check is short, it's going to be some furniture moving up in here. You love the Lord, but you're going to tell somebody where to go and how to get there. Reverend, can I get an amen? Thank you so much. Their treasure is disrupted. Their money is funny. Their change is strange. And when your money is funny, it messes up with your shout. You can't even shout right in church. Because you're thinking about your economy. You're thinking about the bills that need to get paid. Can I have seven people in here who will be honest and testify? You come to church thinking about how you're going to pay some bills and how you're going to handle some responsibility, how you're going to deal with this issue and that issue. There's some people who can testify that when you are dealing with rough realities, worsome situations, it will wear you out. And here they are, these brothers who are being called by Jesus to do something they never anticipated doing. And they're called, being called to do so at a time when they're tired, <laughs> when, when the timing is off and their treasure has been jeopardized. But watch what Brother Peter says. Simon Peter says, Master, I love the way he calls him Master. Master, we toil, work hard all night long and caught absolutely nothing. Watch the next verse. Next word in the King James Version says, nevertheless. <laughs> oh, I like this church. I like this Tri-Cities revival because y'all know when to say amen. You all know exactly when to get happy. He says, nevertheless. Uh, at thy word, I'll let down the net. May I please suggest on a Wednesday night that into every Christian's life, there will come a time when you and I have to insert the word nevertheless into our situation. God, I don't like it, but nevertheless. God, I don't know how it's going to work out, but nevertheless. God, I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, but nevertheless. God, everything is going crazy, but nevertheless, at thy word. At thy word, I let down the net. I'm almost done here. I told you I had two points, didn't I? My first point is that sometimes you and I have to decide to follow Jesus despite worrisome situations. But may I suggest secondly and finally that you and I have to decide to follow Jesus, watch this, by depending on the word of the Savior. I'm done. I'm done. I, I said you and I have to decide to follow Jesus by depending on the word of the Savior. Master, we toiled all night long. Caught absolutely nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I let down the net. Brother Coordinator, I came all the way to Albany tonight to the Tri-Cities Revival to tell somebody, anybody, no, no, everybody, that the word still works. Oh, I thank God for a Bible-believing church in here tonight. I need somebody to help encourage your pew partner and let them know if they haven't smiled yet that the word still works. Oh, if they haven't moved yet, I need you to nudge them just a little bit. Don't hurt them. Just let them know, hey, sister, hey, brother, the word still works. Yeah. 
There come some times when you and I have to depend on the word of the Savior. Because you and I walk by faith. Come on and help me preach. And not by sight. Is there anybody in here who still believes that the word never returns unto him void? Anybody in here still believe that the word of God has power to effectuate change in the life of the believer? Anybody believe that his word will work in your situation to give you victory over your adversity? Somebody ought to testify that the word still works. That, that's, that's all I've been trying to tell you for the last 25 minutes. That's all I've been trying to tell you is that the word still works. And I came tonight to tell you that the word works for our edification. Somebody shout edification. That's a big old churchy word. You got to have that word in your arsenal. The word works for our edification. Edification. It means to build us up. It means to strengthen us. It means to make us tougher than we ever would be without the word in our lives. I need somebody in here who's got some word in you who can testify. You can take stuff better in 2023 than you could handle it in 2020. Is there anybody in here who can testify? Now that you got some word in you, you live better in August than you did in January. I need somebody in here to encourage yourself and tell yourself the word still works. Works to build us up. Works to make us stronger. That's what's been happening in Luke chapter 5. I told you that when Jesus began this chapter, he is preaching on the water. And your Bible says he's preaching the word to them. They pressed in on to hear the word of God. I like that word, word in verse 1. The Greek word is logos. Logos, my brothers and sisters, is the mind of God. It's the intelligence of God. It's the thoughts of God being conveyed to us. And is there anybody in here who test can testify? When I come to church, I don't just want to feel something. I want to know something. Oh, hear me, church. I love a good feeling in church, but is there anybody who's read your Bible? The Bible says with all thy getting, get understanding. Is there anybody who can thank God for the edification you have gotten by understanding the things of God, by studying his word, by learning his word, by feasting on his word, and you can testify you're better now because you've got some word in you. But that's verse 1. But if you read verse 5, you'll find out that the word is there again. He says, nevertheless, at thy word, I let down the net. That Greek word, Brother Harvey, that Greek word, 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 word Brown, that's a different word. That word there is rhema. Now, rhema is a different word from logos. Rhema is a word that is tailor-made for your situation. It is given for you so you can have directives for your life's journey. It literally is God saying, I see you where you are. I know exactly what you need. And I'm going to speak a word to you that's going to give you direction for next week and next month and next year so you can have victory all along your life's journey. Is there anybody in here tonight who can testify that you come to church some? time and it seemed like the preacher knew all your business seemed like the preacher was talking directly to you had been reading your text messages listening to your telephone call that ain't the preacher being nosy that's the holy ghost speaking a word to give you a rhema for your situation is there anybody who can lift your head toward heaven and say speak lord i need a word from you i need to know your logos i need to know your rhema i need to know your will for my life i need edification in times like these i need to be built up in my most holy faith i said the word still works it works for our edification but may i tell you on the second phase of this second point that it still works against your enemy i wish you'd go ahead and get happy with me 
I said it works against your enemy. I tried to tell you, if you were listening to me in the first 17 minutes of this little message, you heard me take you back to chapter 4. And I told you that the enemy came against our master Jesus. And when he came against Jesus, he tried to tempt him three times. And every time he tried to tempt Jesus, Jesus came back at him the same way. It is written. And is there anybody in here tonight who can testify? The word will work against your enemy better than you cussing your enemy better than you plotting against your enemy better than you strategizing against your enemy can I get six people in here who can testify he still makes my enemy my footstool can I get anybody in here who can get happy and begin to testify that no weapon whoo, formed against me shall be able to prosper is there anybody in here who can testify the Bible says he prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemy. Is there anybody who ever here ever seen God shut the mouth of your enemy? Anybody ever seen your enemy have to retreat? Anybody ever seen your enemy tuck tail and run? I wish you'd get some word in you so that you can believe God that no matter how big and bad your enemy is, your is greater anybody know he's greater he's bigger than your problem bigger than your pitfall bigger than your predicament somebody in here ought to thank God that your God is bigger hallelujah I'm trying to quit here but my soul done caught on fire and I'm grateful tonight that he still knows how to shut the mouths of our enemies I'm grateful tonight. He still knows how to edify us and build us up in our most holy faith. I'm done tonight. I've tried to tell you that the word still works. It works for our edification. It works for against our enemy. But I've been waiting all night to tell you that it works to accomplish the extraordinary. Now, now listen, listen. I need to go ahead and tell you, listen, if you get uncomfortable with noise in church, this may be a good time to slip up your Baptist finger and tip out one of these doors. Because I got a funny feeling and a sneaky suspicion that for the next four or five minutes, it's going to get noisy up in the Tri-Cities Revival. I just believe, I just got a funny feeling that when I tell you what your Bible says, it's going to make somebody get happy, even if you got to get happy all by yourself. Is there anybody came to church to be happy tonight? I didn't come to leave here depressed and dejected. I came to get some good news that was going to make me happier on Thursday than I was on Tuesday. The Bible says that when they decided to do what the Lord said do, when they let their nets down, they caught so many fish that their nets began to break. Woo. I told you, I tried to warn you, I tried to warn you. I said they caught so many fish that their net began to break. That the Lord hooked them up so tough at the wrong time. Even when they were tired, even when they were worried about their treasure, God hooked them up so tough that their net began to break. I don't know about you, church family, but I'm in a season in my life where I'm expecting God to provide me some net-breaking blessings. I'm going to E-flat, man. I feel like hollering. Is there anybody in here still looking for some net-breaking blessings from the Lord? Is there anybody who still believes he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think? Somebody ought to expect net breaking blessings. Somebody ought to look your head toward heaven and say, any way you bless me, Lord, I'll be satisfied. But wait a minute, church. That's not even the end of the story. Because if you keep reading, they got net breaking blessings. And their nets began to break so tough that when their nets began to break, they couldn't handle everything by themselves. And so they start calling for their friends. And they said, come over here and help us. Come get some of these fish. Because we can't handle it all by ourselves.
house. And I don't know about you, church family, but I'm in a season of my life where I'm looking for some net breaking, friend blessing, blessing. Is there anybody in the church tonight who can testify once you get in relationship with the Lord Jesus? It's not time to be stingy and selfish. It's time to be a blessing to somebody else when you realize how blessed you are. Is there anybody in this church who can testify? I'm so blessed I can't keep it to myself. I'm so blessed I can't handle it all by myself. But when I get blessed, I will make sure I'm a blessing to somebody else. Will you find somebody who's seated somewhere close to you and grab them by the elbow and say, when I get hooked up, you gonna get hooked up too. When I get blessed, you gonna get blessed too. When the Lord makes a way for me, I'm gonna make sure I make a way for you. I'm looking for some net breaking, friend blessing, blessings in my life. But wait one minute, that's not the end of the story. The Bible says that when they did all of that, they got the fish in the boat and the boat began to sink. Now for some of us that might be frightening, for some of us that may be fearful, but may I suggest that's favor. Because favor is when God takes such good care of you, you can't even take the credit for yourself. Stuff just start to bend over in your life. Folks start to sink it in your life because you got so much in your life that you know God did it and nobody else. And at this season of my life, I'm looking for some net breaking friend blessing folks sinking blessings and is there anybody in this building tonight who can go ahead and help me close this message and testify that's the kind of blessings I believe the Lord will provide if you just decide to follow Jesus so I feel like giving God glory on a Wednesday night because every time I turn around he keeps on making ways for me is there anybody in the building who can look back over your life and begin to testify if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side I don't know where I would be but since I'm here on a Wednesday night I may as well lift my hands toward heaven and begin to thank God for net breaking friend blessing folks sinking blessings is there anybody who can testify all I have needed his hand hath provided great is thy faithfulness Lord unto me is there anybody in this building tonight who can testify he didn't just give me what I needed but he made my cup run over I'm so grateful that he keeps on doing great things for me he keeps on making ways for me so please excuse me but I feel like giving him glory I feel like giving him honor I feel like blessing his name cause he's been so good he's made so many ways he's opened so many doors he's fought so many battles is there anybody in this building who can testify can't nobody do me like jesus can't nobody do me like the lord won't he make a way won't he provide won't he take care then let the redeem of the lord say so give him glory Give him glory! Give him glory! Yeah. Hallelujah! 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 Hallelujah!
boats up on shore, left everything and followed him.